when I'm pulling pictures off of a woman's Instagram and my wife is walking by. <laughs> Put that beautiful sugary sand on the beaches. Those were little mini ecosystems that years ago, the Division of Fish and Wildlife and the DEP identified as essential fish habitat. When you buy this $500 combo, be prepared to leave it there until striped bass fall next December in South Jersey. Yep. Because you ain't gonna use it unless you're going north. If I know that there's a nice solid bite possibly waiting, like it's tough for me to sleep. Like I'm just a kind of still yeah. a, like a kid in a candy store. If you want my honest opinion, shut the season down, period. I, I could even care less about a season. Okay. Well, that's, that's a tantrum, come on, <laughs> come on. All right. Welcome, everybody. Fat Dad Fishing Show. My name is Rich. I'm the host of the show. And tonight, we we got the full deck on board. We've got co-host Ed and co-host John both on tonight. Guys, how you doing? I'd say we're not playing with a full deck, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, doing well. How are you? <laughs> good, good. John, what's up? Oh, you got to turn up your mic, my friend. It'd be great if we could hear you. It, you know, it's funny. We're backstage just so everybody knows. And John was so loud. And then as soon as he put his headset on, the mic dropped. So is he did say the new intro is hilarious. So I, I think he's uh, I, I had to throw the little jab in at him when we were talking about the flounder regs. So, yeah. John, why don't you give it another test? Any good? No. Not get it a little bit louder. All right. Any better? Yeah, there you, there go. you go. All right. Well, then we're just going to do it without headphones tonight. There you go. Well, there's no echo, so we're all good. So, uh, so yeah, everybody, welcome. Um, for those that are unaware, Ed is the owner of Captain Hank's Tackle. John, the owner of Creeley Custom Rods. Um, so check them out if you haven't, if you like them. If you don't, just don't check them out. They're just not worth your time then. No big deal. Uh, so tonight is going to be a really cool one. So we're in that, that weird stage, but it's different this year. You know, it, it's that stage where... Everyone wants to get the last bit of tog fishing in before it shuts down in a couple of weeks. Um, the striper are going to be going hot uh, all up and down the coast, and that's the case right now. Um, and then we still have a month before flounder starts every other year until this year. But flounder is now coming up real fast. It's coming up right on the heels of tog season. So it's a different kind of spring than what we're used to. And, uh, you know, Whatever you think about the actual size limits and the slot for the flounder, I'm really excited because this is going to be great species after great species and no break in there where, where you're just stuck with the, you know, the drum. I, I wouldn't say stuck, but where you're limited to the drum and the, and the striped bass uh, in the middle of May. So I'm looking forward to it. What, what about you guys? John, what are you thinking? It's Hey, I'm excited that Luke's opening early i'm still stuck on my opinion because i'm just afraid of it being you know poached more but whatever um it's finally there's something that's going to fill a gap quicker we don't have to wait around as long so you know and we're going to go for fluke and then you can go sea bass and do a sea bass fluke combo trip right off the gate you know it's it's going to be it's going to be a good thing this year yeah yeah ed what's your thought yeah i'm, I'm pumped to get an early start to fluke this year I'm hoping to get one more tog trip in. We'll talk later about that. But yeah, I'm I'm excited. I'm ready to go. Got uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll mention one thing before we introduce our guest and bring them on stream. Uh, you know, a lot of people had said, you know, it's too early for um, for flounder at the beginning of May. I got to tell you, not only do I have videos on this channel proving that's not true, just saw a uh, a picture again on facebook today a guy pulled a 23 incher out and he's just you know lamenting the fact that it's uh still two weeks early so they are there now they've been there for weeks um you just have to find some slightly you know they're going to be in different places they're not going to be sitting necessarily where they are in the middle of summer but they're in there they're in the backwaters they're offshore so I i'm looking forward to it but Tonight's going to be a good one, uh, everyone. We have Frank Mahalik coming on, and everybody knows who he is um, based on TOG fishing primarily with the Century Pro Togger, uh, the TOG seminars. You know, if it's blackfish that you want to talk about, you want to talk with Frank. And that's one of the things we want to talk to him about, but we'll bring him on now. There's a lot more to your game, Frank, than, than, just, uh, than just blackfish. How are you doing? I'm, I'm great. How are you guys? 
Uh, I'm well. doing I'm doing great. I've been looking forward to this since we talked what back in February about like, having you come on. Listen, yeah. I dug I dug a trench and ran Ethernet cable to be on this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and John said that he he insists. He said, Well, you know, I'm the one who's gonna he's gonna get you Frank to come on. So I am definitely on this episode too. I was like, <laughs> the more the merrier, you know. Uh, just, oh all good i'm glad to be here anything we can do to to promote the fishery and encourage some people to to join the sport that we love and to help them be more successful i think that's a great thing there's just no lose there's no losing to that side i i agree you know the more the more people that are out there catching fish the better as far as i'm concerned and that's not a you know an anti-conservation or preservation type of attitude it's the more people that are out there successfully catching fish and excited about going out there, the more chance we have as the next generation coming on and continuing it. The more money goes into the local shops, the bait shops, the, the guys out, you know, making tackle like Ed, making rods like John, um, all the captains. And uh, the more focus is on conservation at that point. And, and I think we saw that this year with the flounder thing, you know, whether or not you like the way it came out, there were a lot of people on that meeting. For New Jersey, I think there were a hundred, but 140 at one point. I think a bunch dropped off at Sea Bass, or a bunch came on after some of the fluke guys jumped off. But I think it's all good, you know. So That's, there is one of the one of the most popular species in New Jersey. I mean, it's it's so available inshore, offshore, from the beaches. It's just an extremely popular fish, and they're great to eat as well. So, I mean, that's how I started fishing, you know, with my dad in the, in the family boat. I was probably three years old at the time. Did that, you know, every day my dad was down for the weekend. We were out there drifting in the back bays behind Brigantine for fluke. So that's kind of usually how most people start, I think. Yeah. And I never got over it. <laughs> I started nope. there and uh, went offshore for, man, a long time and and kind of returned to the inshore, near shore. And I find that, uh, you know, look, I've never turned down a chance to go out and catch some tuna and and so on. But, um, man, I, there's just something about flounder that just draws me. And it works perfectly for tonight's topic because we're going to be talking about spring fishing um, and we're going to talk. You know, I think we we carved out specifically three species to talk about. Uh, the drum, which is, I think, an underfished and undervalued fishery that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's because it's it's really a short window that you can really get on them with some size in the state. And it's not necessarily statewide. Then we have the, uh, uh, we, we do have striped bass, but we're not going to talk about that today. But we have tog, the blackfish. We got another couple of weeks uh, before they kind of button it up for us and then we definitely have to talk about flounder um and and frank those are all those are three species that you're going to be targeting targeting in spring is that right oh yeah that's all happening right now i mean i'm i'm chartered up every one of my days off in april on my favorite blackfish boats i'm fishing on the fishmonger with jerry posterino i'm fishing on allison's nightmare with chris voss and fishing fever with tom daffin and they're the boats i blackfish on immediately in may it turns right into drum fish i'm again on a charter but i also have my boat in the water now so i'll be on charter or i'll be on my cousin bill's boat fishing the bay for drum and in between that on my other days off i'll be fishing the backwaters behind vendor and margate for flukes that are in the back there right now man i i'm looking forward to that now now let's let's start off talking about um well why don't we do this why don't we start talking blackfish uh because there's only two weeks left before, you know, everything changes on us for, for a little bit. And it, the fishery, you know, the fish are still there, but it kind of goes away for a while where we have to ignore them. Um, so let's talk about that first. And, and Frank, you've kind of made your reputation on blackfish. I mean, anyone who's gone to a show and has any interest in whatever you want to call it, blackfish, taw tog, tog, white chinners, um, they've seen your seminars being advertised. And I think, you know, most people whenever when they've had a chance to have gone in to see them. So, uh, what, what's your thought right now? Let's start off with a real general question. What's your thought right now on the state of that fishery? That's got a tremendous amount of pressure pressure put on it in the last couple of years. And some of the reasons we were talking about a little bit offline, we were talking about the regulations. Some of the biggest pressures on black fishing are things that you never hear of. Like the first thing is. 
Um, you know, we were talking about the fishery management issues. I'm so happy that this October um, sea bass are going to be open because over the last couple of years, the end of September, sea bass closes the whole month of October. You have guys on charter boats everywhere. The only thing that you can fish for is ling, porgy, and the one fish, blackfish, in shore until the stripers arrive. You can fish, right. them, but they're not there. So every charter boat, every private boat is now forced to fish for blackfish the whole month of October. So you pound the hell out of them. And that way in November, when blackfish season starts, the fish are so beat up. Um, spot locks make it, you know, spot lock uh, trolling motors make it a lot easier for guys to get on. Not like it used to be, man. I started out fishing with single anchors and dual anchors. And believe me, you learn the respect and you learn the skill of what these guys go through. Yeah. But the other thing is, too, I mean, on a totally, you know, this is totally from left field. How many of you guys have been out fishing next to a bridge in, say, April, May, and maybe September, October, November, and the tide's slack, and, and there's a boatload of guys come up. You have a little 17-footer with six guys on it and a giant live well. They tie up to the bridge, and they bail little tiny blackfish. It's slack tide. They all go into the live well, and then the tide turns, and then they leave. So they're there for an hour too short of a time for the conservation police to come and get them. And they do this every single tide. So if you don't think that that live fish market is hurting the blackfish stocks, I think it is. Yeah, I have to agree. John, you've got some opinions on this. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm right there with Frank. It's with technology. Now, don't get me wrong. Spot locks are awesome. It's one of the greatest things to slice bread, but how many guys can go out there and throw anchors, you know, and, and like you said, it, it's, they don't know and don't have the respect for those guys that are throwing anchors. It takes time to position and, and know your wind conditions, tides, know everything, how to set yourself up over that piece. You drop a spotlight, boom, you're, you're on the piece. You ain't going nowhere. So it's easier instantaneously to get on the piece, get your limit and go, as opposed to taking 10 minutes to set up on that spot. It, it, this guy's taking two seconds to set up on the spot. And it's so easy to wiggle, you know, five feet, five feet, five feet. Exactly. Five. You don't have any commitment. No. And, and that's the thing. I, I believe that this fishery is being overfished because you have a, a lot of guys going out there, slaughter after slaughter after slaughter. Um, my opinion, it's got to be re-regulated. I don't think there's enough research done on this fishery and granted it's an open fishery and that that's a lot of the problems that people don't realize either is we we say oh it's being overfished this that and the third but it's also an open fishery so how much fish are actually out there but from what can we see a lot of guys are taking these big female breeders they're taking you know five six pounders they're taking all these big fish home without even thinking that this could hurt the fishery so yeah. my opinion, I, I'm hoping to see some kind of a change. I would like to see a three fish limit, two slots, or you know, 15 to 20, let's say, and then 120 plus. But you know, we, we'll see what happens later on down the road. Careful what you wish for. I was going to say you're 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 now going to you know it, for those that saw the intro, you just said you weren't going to you don't care about flounder. Shut it down because they got a slot. Now you're now you're saying get a slot on tog. Slot on togs, fine. That's that's more understandable, but you're not giving me an inch gap at least. You know, that's better. Yeah. That's the thing we need is more regulations because because they don't screw that up, do they? Nah, that they don't, but something does need to be done in my well, opinion. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, according to uh, the latest survey that I saw, and I, I don't remember when it was, um, but it, it showed that the tog fishery is actually strong, New York and North. And in New Jersey, it's pressured, but it's not um, it's not in danger at this point. Mm -hmm. So the science so far hasn't swung towards the anecdotal, which, you know, Frank, right. I've seen a lot of people poaching. Um, yeah. I, I've called the number. I have it on my actually, if I were to take out my phone right now, I think it's the first picture that I have saved <laughs> for the number. Let's do it right now. But to yep. touch on that real quick. Yep, there it they, is. Go ahead. Are the northern fish the same ones? Did you read you read that same thing I did about the DNA testing they did on the togs that like from Maine South or Maine? There's they're different. They're they're the same fish, but their DNA structure is totally different. Mm -hmm. So like from Maine 
So I don't know if it's New York or Maine, but from there south, they're different fish. And mm -hmm. I think Togger all the way down in the Carolinas. Yeah. So are, are, are they even looking at the same things? Yeah, it could be like the, the striped bass. Like you have the Hudson striped right. bass, you have the Chesapeake. You There's know. a bit of genetic, a little bit of genetic mix up there. But what really what really changes with the blackfish is the blackfish that are in blackfish. And I'm not talking about inshore. I'm not talking about when they're inshore playing around the jetties. I'm talking about blackfish, big blackfish that live out on wrecks. When you get a fish that lives in water, 80, 90, 100, 150 foot deep, that fish lives on that wreck. And chances are it never leaves. It has no reason to leave. If the fish is in 80 foot of water, it's going to get pretty cold during the winter. It'll lay over and take a little nap. If it's in 150 foot of water, it's not laying over at all. It's steady eating and, and growing 12 months of the year. So the fish from Cape May to the south tend to grow 12 months a year. The fish from mid-Jersey north grow more like nine months a year. When you get up off a of mass, it's more like seven months a year. So the fish grow much faster from, from extreme southern New Jersey south than they do to the north that's interesting yeah interesting uh, I'll, t I'll tell you i i have my tags i picked two species i'm going to tag this year and i'm doing tog and flounder mm. um so i'm gonna i'm gonna put as many tags as are safe for the fish you know i'm not gonna tag a fish that shouldn't be but um i i plan on putting a lot of them because i do have that the same anecdotal concerns that that you guys have right it, it feels different over the past season plus for me inshore um I, I i don't fish enough offshore to be able to say if there's any you know noticeable difference you look at tom daffin's boat and you're like well it looks pretty healthy that guy as john said as john texted me over the weekend he said daffin's going to get a record it's coming it's coming he's going to get the igfa <laughs> I, I truly believe that that's going to happen on that boat <laughs> nothing it could i don't have anything to say about that <laughs> Hey, look, man, he's had the state record two times. One uh, yeah. was with you on that trip. So, I mean, it, the guy knows how to fish. It's just plain and simple. Dude, you have no idea. You it sounds to me like, Frank, he's saying you're going to catch it on, on Tom's boat. <laughs> I have nothing to say about that. But I will say to you the skill that Tom – guys like Tom and Jerry, you guys don't realize, Tom Daff and Jerry Posterino, these guys are at a whole new level. I mean, whole new level. If you think you're good, when let me put it to you this way. The first time I stepped on the deck at a fishmonger, Joseph Gorski invited me on a charter. I stepped on the boat, and I'm looking at the 10 guys on board except for me. So there's nine other guys. I think six of those other guys all had caught 20-pound blackfish in their life. So if you step on that deck and you don't swallow real deep and hard and, and eat a slice of humble pie real quick, then you're just stupid. Me, yeah. I go on there, I realize, man, I am with some phenomenal fishermen. I shut it down. I try to be a gentleman. I want to be humble. And I'm realizing that this is how I'm going to learn. Because I'm good. I mean, I'm okay. But I wasn't that good. And that was probably like five years ago or so on Fishmonger, four or five years ago. And I can't thank those guys enough because I learned so much from jerry Pastorino and joe zagorski and all the other guys on that boat that are nice enough to share that's how you're really going to learn i don't need to stand up and beat my chest and tell people how great i am the last time i checked that doesn't work and it doesn't make for a very likable individual i'd rather go out there and and just try to learn from guys who are better than me the toughest part is when you're a really good fisherman it's really hard to surround yourself with guys who are actually better fishermen than you. So you really have to challenge yourself to step out of your box a little bit. But Tom Daffin, like no kidding, I've seen us, we've been on a wreck that the day when he caught, we caught that record fish, when Sully caught that record fish, we were on our way out and we stopped at that wreck early and we anchored up and came back on the part of the wreck Tom wanted to sit the boat on and the current was it was slack tied and the current wasn't strong enough. The wind kept pushing us forward on the strings where the anchor lines would come tight. And we would come back and then the then the lines would kind of spring us forward because there wasn't enough tension with the wind to hold us back. So we actually left that wreck, drove another 
15 miles out, caught some fish for a couple hours. And then Tom said, hey, you want to go back to that spot we were at earlier? And we were like, the, you know, and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all went back there and caught fish. And that's when Sully caught that record fish. So God bless him. Awesome, dude. Couldn't happen to a better guy. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. You defined what a, a really good fisherman is. It's somebody who doesn't think they're the best fisherman out there and knows that they got to, you know, you get on the boat with people like that and uh, kind of shut your mouth a little bit and you're watching and you're learning and you're asking a question here. You know, you're not bothering people, but you're asking questions and, and you know, why'd you do that? Um, what do you think? I, this this is what I'm doing. What's your what's your thought on that? And that's the way you get better. I mean, I do that all the time. I think it annoys people sometimes. You know, because I'm just kind of watching. <laughs> I'm like creeping on. I'm just watching. But you know who the best guy is, and uh, I, you know you, that's the way to learn. I don't. I don't know anyone. I've never met anyone that that wouldn't benefit from just sitting down and just watching other people and seeing what they can pick up. That's just it. On on boats like that, anybody anybody can be the be the superhero on any given point in day. Because at any given point in time, that boat is loaded with such excellent fishermen. But to sit here and to fish next to Jerry out of the window and to watch Jerry catch fish is almost, um, you almost can't watch him. He's so, so, so scary good with that. You think he's great handling a boat. You think he's great anchoring on the wrecks and his knowledge is unsurpassed. This is the, this guy's the best guy with a rod in his hand that I've ever seen. It's really, it's, it's just amazing. And I've had enough days fishing next to him where he and I were absolutely on fire, where we were just massacring the fish and everybody else was watching. And then again, I've had other days where I've sat there and just watched everybody else and, and I couldn't get bit. So, you yeah. know, what comes around goes around. You can't talk too much. That's for sure. Sounds like I have to get out on that boat sometime with you guys. Good luck. I know. <laughs> I've tried actually. <laughs> You can't you can't get on there. It's you guys. You get you, Frank, have booked it out. <laughs> Actually, I, I have I work with a couple other guys that they have charters. I have charters. And naturally, I invite them on mine. They invite me on theirs. And that's how we, you know, we, we share the best we can. But in all reality, we've become very, very good friends. And that's what I mean by learning from people that you're that are better fishermen than you it's not saying that you're not you're not excellent it's just saying that if your ego gets in the way it prevents you from even seeing or acknowledging or absorbing that maybe somebody else is a little bit more dialed into this than you are yeah. that's that's just kind of my style i i couldn't agree more with that ed that's why i go fishing with you all the time what are you you're always about? there i don't to, know what to... i'm doing <laughs> Ed's always there to make the comment. Just change the color up. Just change the color. Up. Put on a new lure. I get lazy and I keep the same one all all day. And he'll be catching next to me. He'll be like, just do what you're doing, but change. Put this on. That's that's just my way of getting free lures. But yeah, because you know, then he gets yeah, fed much. up and hands them to me. Um, so so let's talk about. It. So we have two weeks left, uh, approximately, Frank. Um, and this is. You know, do you agree with uh, this is the this is the time for the biggest fish right now? This is the best time. April usually starts out very slow. The first week in April is usually very very slow. Um, it just so happened that year I had to work the first weekend in April, so I didn't go. The second, third, and fourth weekend in April, I'm I'm fishing every one of my days off, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, because at the end of April, the weather starts to moderate, so it's a little easier to fish on a nicer day. And as the water starts to warm up a little bit, those fish do become more active and they're definitely going to give you a better shot at catching them. And, and the bigger ones. Well, yeah. And again, that has a lot to do with the weather. It has a lot to do with yeah. the chance to be able to run offshore a little bit. It's been tough this year. I mean, it's been impossible for me. I've been on the water twice. One day I shouldn't have. Um, the other day was just so early and stripe for striped bass. It was the only thing open. Um, didn't have a good day, but, um, I'm, you know, we were talking backstage beforehand, trying to get, get out there somehow. It looks like John's going to try Saturday Ed, I know you can't go Saturday. I'm going to try Sunday. I'm in for um, Sunday. All right. I, I can't do Saturday, but I can do early Sunday. I got to be home back in Pennsylvania by five. So I, I'm going to go out. I'm going to be trying to inshore talk. Definitely. Um, 
you know, I, I don't think it's going to be good enough weather to head offshore at all. And the water's still cold. Ed doesn't have a dry suit, so we'll stay in the back. Yeah, you guys um, in the back. Yeah. yeah I ain't going yeah. out there. Not a plastic <laughs> boat. So, so w let's talk a little bit, Frank, about the tactics. So um, let's say we we're able to get out there on uh, um, Fishmonger or any other boat and we're heading offshore. What, are you are you one of the folks that says, all right, we're not we're not dropping white leggers. Uh, it's spring. We're dropping clam. Or what are you using for bait? Are you changing it up at all? We have white crabs. We have green crabs and we have clam. And we also usually bring a bag of cooked whole shrimp as well. And I mean, cooked whole shrimp, like no shell pink, like ready for the cocktail sauce. And they're usually the baits that we're fishing in the spring. Whereas in the fall, the soft baits go away. But in the spring, the clam and the shrimp are, are usually on every boat we're fishing on. Can we back up one John, second? John with that shrimp eating grin. I, I got to back up one second. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> Peeled and cooked shrimp. You can't use the live. They won't take it, correct? I they, know they, they won't. You know, they eat the cooked shrimp much better than they eat the raw shrimp. And I... I I don't know why. Hey, there's right. no answer to it. I just I wanted to close that debate out real quick since you know you're the pro tiger. Here. I'm not lying to you, brother. I'm I'm just telling you what what my observations are. Uh, I'll defer to you then because I was the one arguing with John about that. I'm like, are you sure cooked? That doesn't make right. much sense. <laughs> now, me personally, I mean, when I was out fishing last weekend, um, there's guys on the other side of the boat that are very, very good fishermen and they were using green crabs and they were catching small fish. That wasn't really my thing. I was fishing sweetheart rigs and I was fishing with nice white leggers about four inches across that I trimmed the legs off and, you know, hooked them on my sweetheart rig and stepped on them a few times. And I put them out there and gave them a big soak. And to be honest with you, I'm not really worried about catching a lot of fish. I'm worried about getting the right bite. And if I did get the right bite, I got one really nice bite. I had the fish on, I had the rod up, I had the fish off the bottom, and the fish was dogging in mid-depth, and it was a really good fish, and, and the hook broke. I mean, oh. what is the of an owner hook breaking? I I don't think I've seen one break before, but I had one break, and that's just that's just fishing. Yeah, well, well I, I'll give you a congratulations on breaking an owner. It's not easy. Uh, it broke right below the barb, right where the barb opens up. It came down about maybe another eighth of an inch and just snapped clean off wow wow yeah I, i'm kind of into the the quality now you know it's i'm definitely like that with flounder um you know i used to just i, I didn't care i'd bring in a whole bunch of 16s throw them back it didn't matter to me and i very rarely do that anymore it's just all right i'd rather just get some large ones you know e even this year i don't care about the slot limit i'm still going to try for the bigger fish i'll just end up throwing them back it's fine mm -hmm. with me um but I, I don't know, Tog, and maybe I'll use that as my excuse for why I don't catch a ton of Tog. I'm just going for the Giants. Yeah. Well, for those hooks, I mean, those hooks, you know, use them offshore. You don't need to use them shore. Inshore, no. I'm using, um, I'm actually not using Gamakatsu's much. I'm using the new Saltex hooks made by Tsunami. They're really, really a nice hook. It's a much thicker wire than a Gamakatsu. But usually when it comes to hooks, I'm fishing with something for a particular reason. Like when I'm when I am togging offshore and I'm using that five odd uh, owner octopus, it's the cutting point hook. It's a very very durable hook. If you use a needle point hook in that kind of fishing, and you do drag it across the wreck or drag it across just the barnacles a little bit, sometimes that needle point will actually just snap right clean off. And next thing you know, you're fishing and you're missing a fish and you're missing a fish. And then you check your hook and and your point broke three fish ago. Well, what if fish number two was it was a double digit fish and you missed it because you're used the wrong hook? Yeah, you know that's a good point. I don't I don't check my uh, my hooks nearly enough. Ed, are you checking your you you probably check yours every once in a while being the the tackle guy? Well, yeah, I mean only because I, I'm more concerned with putting out a, a quality product that's going to last. So if if I notice something funny going on with my stuff, you know I'm me and the, my guys you you know the pro staff guys were all the first ones to get this stuff so if something goofy is going on i want to know about it but i mean i'm the the new hooks that we're using i don't really notice them getting beat up too bad so no well they're on jigs too or, or frank are you using jigs at all or are you using <clears throat> rigs i'm using jigs at time but i am i'm talking about rigs right now and here's yeah. here's what a you know the cutting point hook it looks normal but i don't know if you can see the 
the yeah, actual zoom in. brines in the tip. You really can't see them. But the tip, instead of it just being a wire that's conically ground, um, it actually has grooves cut into it to make it an extremely durable hook. But yeah. on jig, um, on jigs, I'm I'm using I'm using a variety of jigs. I usually use Dante's Tog jigs. Um, they're nice stuff, Magic Tails, or I use you know whatever's on the boat. So yeah. I do okay. They use really nice hooks on them, and they do seem to hold up very well. You should give ads a try sometime. He's got this, uh, yeah. I don't even know what the hook is called. He's got a really interesting hook on there that um, just seems to catch, it seems to catch the mouth just right. Mm -hmm. um, unlike the regular, uh, I, I don't even know what, 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 what kind of hook is that, Ed, if you can say. I don't know even know if you want to share that. The one I'm using, um, yeah. it's, it's kind of a, it's like a version of a sickle hook. Uh, it's got a pretty deep V. I don't think I have any in front of me but it's got a pretty deep v in it um whereas like the mustad that the the uh i can't remember the the hook number it's a it's a round bend hook that the must most most guys are using for the mustad mm -hmm. um these ones it seems is like when you go to set the hook it will it'll catch the rubber lip more than it it'll bury in the in the mouth um that's just what we've noticed but they they hold up pretty well they bend they don't snap like the the forged hooks it, um these yeah, are a little is. these are a little more a little more forgiving john put your hand behind that so people can see that yeah. that hook it has yeah there you go like a, a sickle shape like ed was saying yeah i'm a fan of those um i thought those were interesting when ed first showed them to me um and then i tried them and i got uh I was hooked on them right away. I was like, wow, these, these just seem to, to set better, but, but you're typically for the biggest fish are you using rigs or you, or, or do you think you can catch big fish on jigs as well? Yeah, I'll use both during the day, depending on what's going on. Um, it really depends on the day and the season and what I'm into doing, but I will share this with you. Something you guys really need to really need to be concerned with. And this goes across the board for fluke inshore and everything else too. But when it comes to fishing a tog jig, Picture you being in the back bay behind Margate, you're in 20 foot of water, okay? all Say it's an incoming tide. All that water is coming through the inlet. It's, just, it's coming through the marshes. It's being channeled through the marshes. And it's coming up into shallower and shallower and shallower water. So all that water that's moving in is not losing any steam. It, all of that current is actually being more and more and more compressed into the shallower water. It's so hard to fish a one ounce jig in 20 foot of water in the back bay. Then when you're six miles offshore and you drop a one ounce jig in with half a crab, it just goes, bloop, 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 goes right to the bottom. It sits on the bottom just nice as could be. It's like yeah. you're fishing in a mill pond. There's really no perceivable current per se out there. Now, there's days when the swell might be taking it or there might be a little bit of bottom current that will walk your jig around. But for the most part, I'm just telling you, inshore fishing a jig can be really, really brutal. It, it can be. Um, I actually have started using the heavier ones inshore. Um, unless I unless I fish an eddy, like the backside of a bridge piling or the the down current side of a jetty something like yep. that then I'll, I'll typically stick with a three quarter ounce to one ounce but besides that my standard if it's if it's not going to be an area like that there's a there's an inshore back bay wreck that we have fished and I, I will fish an ounce and a half back there because it's right next to a channel and it just mm -hmm. it can just whip it right to the side in seconds you have the you there's times to do that when it's when the tide starts to slack off slack tide and it just starts to go the other way then you can get away with that but when the tides running i was fishing a wreck like that that i i fish a lot and um and i had the guys on my boat using sixes and they were getting blown back a little bit and the guy that's on my on the boat that day he was a jig maker and he insisted on using a jig he couldn't hit the bottom with a with a three ounce jig if his life depended on it there was no way yeah there was it was a deep hole. Um, I was in a 40 foot deep hole and I and to get back onto this wreck, I dropped my anchor on like a six foot ledge. So imagine the current coming at you in six feet of water and yeah. then you're back setting in 40. There is so much top current in that first 10, 15 feet of water. I was lucky to get on the bottom of the six. Sounds like we're fishing the same exact spot. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> 
to uh, um, interrupt real quick. Yep. Uh, Frank, what, what hooks were you using? Hooks on my rigs? Yes. Yeah, I believe that's what he's asking. Owner, five <clears throat> cutting point octopus hooks. Five what? Owner cutting point. Okay. And then you switched up to the tsunami for the back, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This the tsunami saltex hooks in like a 4-0 are, are very nice for in the back. They have a heavy wire. The eye is meticulously done on those hooks. The finish is really nice on them. It has a needle point, so it's not quite if you're fishing a really, really heavy structure. I'm going to have to give them some time tests in there, but I'm going to use those hooks a lot because they're definitely a really nice quality hook. Well, they're also they're also a bargain hook. It's surprising the, the quality that Tsunami puts out with some of their less expensive stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely shocking to me. Like even their Storm Shad, this the Storm Wild Eye versus the Tsunami. I've now gone straight over to Tsunami, yeah. and I, they may be the same price now, but they used to be a lot less expensive. Um, so Tsunami's me. I I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, they're they're really making a play for the uh, for the market, and they're doing a good job. I really like their talking popper too, the small one for us, yes. but the medium size and the large size one up at the canal. I mean, I go to the canal, you know, I'm, I'm fishing with like 35 and 40 year olds, you know what I mean? And I'm, you know, after a couple of days of throwing an 11 foot rod and a four ounce pencil popper, I was really, really happy to get that, that two and a half, two and three quarter ounce talking popper. Yeah. And I, able to bomb it you know without without constantly tearing up my shoulder but and caught some caught some really good fish on those on those poppers as well frank you sound like me you see the two young guys are just kind of smiling i'm the same way it's like uh, okay you can toss those big ass baits all day and I, no i'm not going to be doing that it's going to take its toll on me my back is going to be killing me yeah yeah did you ever hear the story about the young buck and the old buck ran up on the hill I'll tell you that another time. All right. well, that's my dad's <laughs> favorite story. <laughs> yeah, I'm surrounded by the young bucks all the time, and it, it drives me nuts. They like to make fun of me, but. Yeah. Hey, man, you know what? Like I said, surround yourself with better fishermen. As you get closer to the top, the, the circle gets shorter. You also got to have guys that you can stand. You know, I mean, I know some guys, like me personally, I work, I do work with Tsunami. I do work with Century a lot with Century Rods. But I don't, I don't do it for free stuff. I don't want free stuff. I'll be glad to pay for all my stuff. I work with these companies because they actually invite me into the process where they let me help them make things better. If that, if that makes sense to you, it it, I, it makes sense to me because I mean, look at the me, Ed, and and John. That's exactly what we do. We don't give free stuff to each other. Mm -hmm. um or anything like that we're just constantly we're constantly collaborating on things you know john's made some rods with you know that that i've had some in well one that i've had some input on and we've been talking about um doing another ed actually has some bucktails that he and i designed together um mm -hmm. i'm not making a dime off of them by the way but um it's pretty cool you know and they work which which is awesome so i i i'm right there with you i i think it's awesome I mean, I've done stuff with companies where they gave me companies that gave me like half a dozen rods and a hoodie and a hat. And uh, I was out fluking on the on the on the fishmonger and I hooked up one. I snagged a rock and I like, you know, you don't know it's a rock when you're drifting for fluke. Yeah. And you, you go to set the hook and, and the rod breaks in half. It broke like right above the stripper guide. And I let the guy know, hey, man, this prototype broke. He goes, oh, send me a picture. I sent him a picture. He goes, oh, yeah, I sticked it. I'm like. What? No, that's not that's not what a high stick is. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 high stick. But I tell him like that's okay. I got all the rods, his hoodie, his hat. Saw him at a show, gave it all to him. Here you go. What? What? You want some? No, nah, no, nah, it's okay. I'm just going in a different direction. Here's all your stuff. I mean, I'm going to be a gentleman about it. I don't yeah. want. I'm not going to sell it. But at the same time, I want to be involved in the process to make to make the rods and the reels and the gear better. Because if we can get better gear in the hands of people, they're going to catch more fish. And, yeah. and if we can get better gear that's less expensive, there's going to be more people fishing. And that's where I want to be involved. You know? I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the, the thing, the good example for me is everybody, you know, what rod and reel should I get? And every, every thread on social media, somebody's going to say, get an ugly stick. Mine never broke. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's the standard. 
you know that's like saying get a uh, get a Porsche mine's never crashed it, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything uh, but you're, you're, same, but in the same for instance remember what was your first car you had in high school Honda Accord okay you had a lot of good times in that car didn't you I sure did yeah now <laughs> picture, now picture in this day and age and it's a hundred degree day and you're driving down the expressway and you have a choice between driving that brand new Porsche Panamera or you're going to drive that old Honda Accord. Which one are you going to drive? I think I'm going to Porsche. And once you get in that Porsche and you go to about a half a mile, you're never going to go turn back. That is true. So that is true. We, we fall in love with gear. We fall in love with rods and reels and the fish that we caught on them. But when you hop in that new Panamera, it's no, there's no denying that that thing's something special. And that's like what happens whenever I fish on a boat. I, I bring my two pro toggers and I always bring an additional one. So if anybody on the boat wants to use it, I put it in their hands and say, use it all day. There's just something special about it. And, yeah. I, you know, there's a lot put into that thing. I do the same thing when I'm out fishing. If, if I have enough tackle, I'll start handing stuff out here. Try this. Tell me that. Yeah. Let me know what you think about this. And, it, it, you know, it's always, always trying to improve. Mm hmm. That's how I try to get free stuff from Ed, but he he's on to the fact that that's what I do every time. <laughs> I just put it on your tab. <laughs> that's true. I do have a tab. <laughs> you, you know, you do. You really do. You do have to push yourself. You have to push. You have to push the technologies of the rods and the reels and even lines. I mean, look how much the fishing world changed. You guys probably don't remember before there was braided lines. Oh, I do. Uh, I'm your age, man. I, I know. Uh, it, the do. mono, the you know, the memory on the mono, <laughs> you cast I, out and there'd just be circles going all the way out into the water. <laughs> I remember surf fishing. I used to use 17-pound dandy mono. And then one year I started using braid. I was using 50-pound braid, and I was outcasting that 17-pound mono so badly. And I felt everything so well that by the time I caught on what was going on, and I dropped down to like 30 pounds a couple years later, you know, but then again, that braid puts so much stress on the rod and it, it puts does. stress on the reel. I mean, like yeah. I was talking to you earlier about the drum fishing trip where I, I actually twisted the main shaft on my, one of my blackfish reels, one of my Saltiga 15s, anchored boat, 65 pound braid, pro togger rod, tightened down drag and 65 pound fish. Something's got to twist a little bit, I guess. So. Thankfully, I caught the fish. Nothing broke. Everything was okay. But I'm looking at my reel like, I guess that fish is a really good testing opportunity for tackle, but I need to loosen the drag up a little bit. Yeah. Or continually replace your reel. Well, bring them in for service at least. Get a new, uh, get some new parts in there. Oh, man. So, I'm so good with my gear, though. I'm not used to doing that kind of stupid stuff. Yeah. Well, well, you, you have really nice gear. I mean, I've seen, I haven't used a pro togger yet. Um, John keeps telling me that he's going to show me the way, uh, with, with a <laughs> rod like that. And and I did check him out at the show. It's a nice rod. What, what, what were some of the things that you were really looking for when you designed that rod? We, we went through a couple of prototypes. So we got the blank perfect. And once we got the blank perfect, Ryan White from Hatteras Jacks, he just really, really trusted me. And what I mean by that is I told them the the real the butt length, I wanted a certain section. I wanted a two finger trigger grip real seat. I wanted an oversized foregrip, not long, but short and fat. Um, and that is that is there specifically for the perfect balance. It just gives it the perfect balance so that when you're fishing a slack line, by the time you put the reel on that rod, you can you can hold that you can put your hand right in front of the reel, just right there, and the rod will just sit there. And the eight-foot rod, it'll just sit there and float. It doesn't go down. It doesn't go tip down. It doesn't go tip up. So you're holding a rod. The rod itself weighs 9.6 ounces. With the reel, it weighs in at like a pound and a half. It's ridiculously light yeah. for a legit big fish blackfish rod. Um, like I said, we had to go through the we had to go through the blank a couple times to get that exactly where we wanted it. But Century lets you do these things because Century is such a small batch rod making company. And the way they make their rods is crazy. Like they do this thing. They put their rods in what they call an auto. They put it through the autoclave process. Yeah. And what that means is most rod companies, when they make a rod, they spin 
they spring, they spin um graphite thread on the or a fabric on the mandrel, and they coat it with resin, and that's it. Century uses a mandrel, and while they're doing it, the mandrel is actually part of an autoclave process where while they wrap it with the fabric, they add pressure inside of the blank. At the same time, they're adding a vacuum to the outside outer walls of the blank. At the same time, they're pumping it full of heat activated resin so that it goes through. So as the resin is impregnating the blank, the heat is making it flow perfectly. Pressure on the outside, pressure on the inside makes the walls perfectly uniform with no air gaps. That's why you can have these rods that are so light and thin and silly sensitive and they don't blow up. But think of this, this autoclave is not an easy process to put on every single, you know, to run every single blank that they make through an autoclave adds a tremendous amount of money to the manufacturing process. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, though. Um, you can tell the difference between standard, you know, an MHX and a, you know, I mean, that's a little too lower and and a century. You know, I mean, you can, I, you can, it doesn't take any, you don't have to be an expert. You just pick that up and you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And it's so light. They are yeah. so light. It's ridiculous. And sir, fries, like, I mean, go, go cast that thing all day and tell me how good your shoulders feel. Because if you're, you're throwing that century surf machine elite, you're going to feel pretty damn good when you're throwing the competitor's rod, you know, pick up the llama glass I was using 15 years ago. It's like, ugh. You have to put so much more power into the stroke to try to get that that lure to fly. And the century, I just find like the for casting, it's it's not about power. It's just about the perfect stroke, get the right drop on the lure, and just let it go, man. And it, man, it'll just fly. Yeah, you let the rod do the work. There's lama glass. That's what I used in the back in the day, and it was you had to haul that off. I mean, the the guys that worked out. Uh, were the ones that were tossing it further because it took a lot of muscle mm -hmm. to really get the the most out of those rods. Now they're great rods. I'm not saying they're not great rods, but it took a little bit more to get them to uh, to perform the way that they were supposed to perform. At least back in the day. Yeah, I haven't used one in a while. Yeah, I had a I had a 1081L. That was my favorite jetty rod for a lot of years. But we're talking about like 1995. Yep, that's you know, when I was using them. Yeah. You're 20, 27 years later, bro. You know what I mean? Like I said, think about the car you drove in high school. It's it's a different time, man. Well, John, John's bringing me up to, you know, the he's he's making me see the light on the new rods. Yeah, but I, I definitely would like to try that that Pro Togger. Um, now, are you going to be using the Pro Togger when you're fishing for drum as well? Yeah, I'll be using I'll be using Pro Toggers. I'll also be using. Um, we also are doing something different with the weapon. It's a century weapon rod that we use. It's like a seven and a half foot, seven ten. We do we do this thing called a mag taper, where we take the diameter of the blank, whatever the diameter of the weapon was, and we blow it up a little bit. We make it a we make it a wider diameter taper, while decreasing the di diameter of the thickness of the wall. So it keeps the weight about the same but it makes the blank itself quicker and stiffer if yeah. that makes sense so we're it able, does. we're able to change the actions by you know just changing the tapers on some of these rods so i'm i'm going to be using that that weapon mag taper for drum fish as well i'm going to get a few on the jig oh yeah yeah and and you said you've got four trips booked for uh for drum fish down yeah. delaware bay mm-hmm and uh and you you said you're going to use jigs i'm going to use jigs far away. usually when we set up for drum we'll drop the hook in we'll come tight to the spot where we want to fish and usually i'm looking for a place like i'm going to be looking for the edge of the channel where if you look at a channel and a channel usually goes up and it'll kind of curve a little bit i'm going to look for the side of the wall that the current's going to hit and come up into the shallow water so I'm usually going to be fishing on on that edge as it starts to shallow up there. I don't just like go out and, and pick a random spot, you know. Right. And what I really do is I'll throw these jigs far off the back of the boat, back you know maybe 50 feet, and then I'll then I'll have pro toggers up closer to the boat, and I'll throw them out away from the boat, like 20 foot each to the left and the right. So the pro toggers will have like six ounce weights. The jigs will have like maybe two ounce jigs, and they'll just go out away from the boat as well. 
Gotcha. Are you moving the jigs at all, or are you just no. letting them sit? Just letting them sit. Okay. Put a right. half a crab on there, or a you know, or a big clam, and have at it. And this this up on the screen is what you're going to be targeting. Yeah. Man, that's a nice fish. That's on my cousin Bill's boat. Bill Bill has his boat in the Morris River. He fishes down there a lot. So I'm a I'm a lucky man. I have uh, have access to some very good fishermen who are and, kind and, of take me along. And that's the day that you want right there. Look at that. It's like a lake. Mm -hmm. Just glass right behind you. Yeah. Man, John, uh, you're you're planning on heading out drum fishing. Ed, I don't know if you've committed yet to mm. to heading out for uh, for drum yet this season, but. Uh, John, what are you bringing out for? You don't have a pro togger, right? No, I do actually. Oh, you do? Um, oh, that's right. You just built. Uh, okay. Yeah, I built that not too long ago, and you know that actually, I didn't get to talk about that. But going back to like Frank was saying, you know, helping people with development and everything, Frank was just gracious enough to say, "Come over to my house, take any of the measurements you need." He's like, "I want this built right, so you have the right rod." So I mean, it goes back to you know that conversation we're, we're all here to help each other out and i think that goes a long way and i appreciate that frank um but yeah i think i'm going to be using that myself i also have a short stick up there that i would like to try i actually made it for yellowfin jigging um let's try it out i, I know it can handle drum but i don't know if that, that's going to be the answer but uh also have the weapon mag jr blank on the way too it's going to be a little too light, I think, on my end for that. So I, I don't agree. know. I'll, I'll find a jig rod. I'm sure I got one laying around. I can I, I've got some old rods that I'm going to try to break. So no, <laughs> I mean I'll they're 30, 40 year old rods. Yeah, yeah, we'll I think be... it'd be fun to break one. <laughs> <laughs> and then the kayaks slipping, and then we're saving them. Quaz got a. I tell you what, man, those drum fish—they wear a hoop, though. I mean, people say, "Oh, they're like reeling in an old tie or this and that." No, they're not. I think they need to match their gear to that fish, and I, I certainly had a blast with them things, so I, I can't wait to do much more of that. Yeah, I I hear a lot of people say, you know, things like that. Drum drum are, they fight, and they pull, and they, they make long runs. They're not like... Because you're in shallow water. They have to make long runs. Yeah, that's like the joy of catching a redfish in the shallows because mm -hmm. it has only one way to go, and that's to the side. It, it's yeah. straight away. You know, it just takes off and, uh, you know, drummer like that drum definitely fight. Now, if it's not, if it's not a fight and you're just reeling it in, you're way over geared for that fish, you know? So, I, okay. I can see it in that case, you know, people talk about the, um, they compare them to the, um, what are they? The sand tigers, which really do not fight at all. Those big yeah. sharks with the big snaggle teeth. Those things don't fight at all. They'll just kind of like swim right in, right into shore. You can literally walk right next to their mouths and they won't even try to bite you. They're so docile. And that's how I've, I've seen so many people compare them, but it's not the same at all. Um, like I, I had told you before we started the stream, my grandfather had caught one it was 72 pounds and it took him two hours to get it in because he kept making runs, almost spooled him a couple of times. Um, he was under geared um for it but um still i mean it was just crazy runs and he was burning that drag out so what well, uh, these augers i was using last year like i said i was using 65 pound line my drag was so tight because when i'm fishing four rods i didn't want to hook a drum on the front rod and have it go back and and tangle up all the other rods so it was like full contact drum fishing man i had to drag tight down and boom, I was in the corner and I was putting the wood to him. Wasn't no playing around. I didn't have to rod up in the air. It wasn't no high sticking. That rod was, I had the bend in the bottom of, her, of the rod and I was putting heavy, heavy heat on them fish. Um, and I didn't, don't think I need to put that much heat on them. But what I mean to tell you, like I had a, like, I had like 30 pound fish to the boat in less than a minute. I'm not exaggerating, not exaggerating a, a little bit. I had a 65 pounder to the boat in probably three minutes. So, I mean, you know, if, if you know how to use your gear, you can do amazing stuff with it. You might break a few reels in the process. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, see, in, in the kayak, though, we'll be in good shape because the kayak actually is an advantage when you have a fish of significant weight and size. So if you hook up to the bigger ones, you just disconnect from the, your anchor, let the float out, and 
it just pulls you. You get the Nantucket sleigh ride and you have mm-hmm. your drag plus the weight of the kayak plus the weight of you. You just have to be careful when it changes direction that you're, you know, you're holding your rod out real far in front of you as it comes around behind you. So it swings your bow instead of spinning you and yeah. pulling you right over the side. You know, back to what you said earlier too, Rich, my friend, my friend, Mike Krawicki caught a couple drum in LBI surf a few years ago and they were like 20, 25 pounders. And he said that was the best fight fish he ever had in the surf. Yeah. And uh, simply because what we're saying, you get them up in the shallow waters and there's no place for them to go. And I mean, that's pretty good size fish with a big broad tail and a lot of heart. So it's going to give you a tussle. Yeah. It's not like a tog. It's not like a redfish. Um, The redfish is... Excuse me. The redfish is definitely the drum that's going to fight harder, but it does fight. I mean, it's and it does have power. And once it gets its head into the, you know, the direction it wants to go, it's just going to dog you straight mm-hmm. out. So um, definitely the smaller, the smaller ones, they, they have an attitude, you know, so the smaller, which are, by the way, the, the tastier and the less worm infested ones. Those are the ones that you really want to target if you're going out there. I won't keep another one. That's for sure. No, <laughs> I mean, they're it's you know it's like you get one you eat it you taste it you're like oh it's good it doesn't rank with yeah. the other you know flounder it doesn't work, rank it, with tog the work to clean those fish is it's not even funny i'd way rather just let them go sure and and well you've cleaned i saw the the one fish you've cleaned the really big ones and those scales man they will kill your knife mm-hmm. they're they're like i don't even know what they're, they're so thick it's ridiculous and they're so yeah. big they certainly are. They're like they're like half dollar size. Yeah, and I have them in my garage. I wrote the date on them when I caught them. Yeah, they're they're pretty cool though. I mean, they're yeah. they're definitely worth saving a couple of those because I mean, comparing to something like a flounder where you can't even see them, Good and then stuff. you you know you get a big drum and you know it's filling up the your front pocket, <laughs> yeah. carrying it around. Yeah, it's crazy. It's good stuff though. So okay, so we, a couple of other things. So I think. For drum, so your tactic, you, you explained it a little bit. Are you dropping chum down? Are you using the clam uh, the clam chum or using any other kind? Clam shells, we're going to be tossing them overboard as we're going. And we're basically going to, um, like I said, we're going to throw two, we're going to fish with like a four foot, a four foot liter of like 50 pound fluorocarbon or mono. I usually use an dot circle hook and a fish finder rig. And I'll use like six ounce weights on the, on the rods that are closest to the boat. So in the, in the front rod holders, we'll toss them out like 15, 20 feet on each side of the boat. And then in the back, in the back side of the boat, I'll, I'll be fishing like two ounce jigs and I'll cast them out like 30 or 40 feet. And again, not straight back, not straight off the back of the boat, kind of off quartering a little bit so that I am covering a, a pretty good array of territory there. Yeah. And you're, I, I assume that you're throwing those shell clams out in a fan behind the uh, boat. Just, just dumping them over oh you're just dumping them okay yeah those fish are going to move through if you're sitting there on a day that's as calm as that you can actually you can actually see the fish moving towards you like they usually move in with the tide whereas yeah. if you're looking if you're standing on the bow of your boat and you're like looking up towards your anchor line a lot of times you can see like plumes of like mud come up from the bottom and you can you know that that's feeding drum fish and they'll work their way towards you and when they do you know you just boom 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 you get all covered up and it's mayhem for a few minutes kind of fun it's kind of like uh freshwater carp you can see when the carp are coming in and they're tailing um it's a little deeper for the drum usually on these clam beds or these oyster beds but it's you see you see all the garbage coming up from the bottom you can also hear them yeah, uh, quite often. Now, do you fish for them during the day or do you go at night or both? Daytime. Yeah, it's all I, daytime. You know what? It, things do not have to be as complex as people make them out to be. Of course, you can catch drum fish at night, but you don't have to catch them at night. You, they're in there in the daytime just as well. There's no big mystery. There's no magic skill set. You can go out there and have fun with big fish and have a good time and enjoy it. I find you do, you know, you do have to play to tie the running tide. You're going to get a lot more. Um, last year, they were feeding really well on the incoming tide. The f- tide started coming in about the first two hours or so. It was really quiet. 
and then all hell broke loose and we had we ended up with nine fish in like an hour and a half or so and we came in so it was great but you know things don't always have to be overly complex sometimes people they like to make themselves seem overly important by making it seem like there's some big mystery involved and that's just so not my style man i'm more of a you know let me just tell you exactly how it is yeah you're a normal guy <laughs> you just guy who loves fishing knows what he's doing is like well this works i don't have to I don't have to do all this other crazy stuff. I personally like fishing for them at night, but I think that's because when I first started fishing for them, I had little kids and we would, you know, I'm not from the coast of New Jersey. Um, so it would be a vacation. So I would mm -hmm. go down, I'd spend the day with the kids so I could only fish at night. So I, I learned how to catch everything at night. And that's where I did 95% of my fishing, probably for about 10 to 15 years on the boat, on kayaks, uh, a lot from the shore and drum I did do, and I did it from shore um, in the Delaware Bay, actually right near Villas. I just mm -hmm. hopped over, threw some clam out into the water, and uh, and that's where I was catching my first drum fish at there night. And it was cool because you could hear them coming. Mm -hmm. You could hear them out there. Yeah. That was when Villas was quieter. <laughs> it's now it's now loud in the summers. I have to say, I hear it's an interesting place. Yeah. For sure. Yep, definitely. But I, All right. do, I do tend to get really into the details of everything. I mean, I want my rigging to be meticulous, but I really don't want to make things overly complex because I just don't. Number one, I don't think it's needed. And, I, and I've witnessed enough people in this world that just try to make themselves seem so, so, so important by making, you know, I mean, how many people, you know, they tie a knot, they add one extra twist to the knot and then they're naming the knot after them. It's like, really, right. dude? Like, really, you think you know, we kind of see what you did there and it's kind of stupid. Right. You did that because you messed up the first time and it's still held. <laughs> you know, in, it's in my uh, opinion, really, I think it's a little bit pathetic. I think it's it's just kind of, you know, somebody invented the knot. That's what it's called. That's what it is. You don't, you know, you're no less of a man because you didn't name a knot after yourself, man. Right. Well, I'm never going to have a knot named after me. I know I know and use about uh well, I know a lot, but I haven't tied more than I think three or four different knots in the past 10 years. I found the ones that I like. I use those exclusively and I forget the ones that I used to use back in the day. Yeah. But your you know, your point about not overthinking, I think that's huge because and that's something that I try to do. You know, I've done live streams in the past where I'm like, all right, guys, just throw out spots. I'm going to show you exactly how to find the flounder in this in this area that you're looking at. And it literally takes five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not complicated as long as you know the certain types of structures that you want to look for. You know, you want to look for the current, you want to look for the structure, and you want to look where there's kind of funnel the bait fish into an ambush zone. Once you have that, it's really not that complicated. And I try to and that's kind of how this channel started trying to show people it's not that hard. It, it's just, you haven't looked at it this way in the past. You know, you've gone out and you've drifted the same channels that everybody else has because everyone's there. So you figure somebody knows what they're doing. Well, not necessarily. It doesn't mean anyone knows what they're doing. It just means it's an easy drift down the middle of a channel. I probably I the worst spot to go fall in love with it. You know, like that, that's their spot. That's their spot. They fish. But that spot might be really good on the outgoing tide with the west wind. But what do you do if it's a south wind? You still want to fish the same spot? Because now the wind's pushing you. The wind's pushing you with the tide when it's incoming. So when it's incoming, you're flying. And then when it's outgoing, the wind's against the tide. So you're not really doing anything. Right. You know, that's one thing with like with inshore fluke fishing. I always, always look for conditions. I'm more... I'm more hunting the conditions that I want. And once I find the proper conditions and the proper drift, I will absolutely find a fish. Yeah, absolutely. And, and most people don't. They, they find the longest uninterrupted drift that they can do, and they just drift it. Now, mm -hmm. I think the trolling motors and the spot locks will help because now you don't have to accept a drift, right? Um, the pedal kayaks are awesome because we never accept any drift as a natural drift we're always pedaling and adjusting and it's really easy it's not tiring so we'll you know we're pedaling and constantly changing our drifts and we're hitting the structure that we want but the boat guys if you don't have a trolling motor you are at a little bit of a disadvantage 
um, in the in the backwaters at least. You know, otherwise you're going to be right nose up on a sod bank because you the spot could, that you want is within five feet of that sod bank. You just have to know your waters. You know what I mean, Rich? Yeah. Like, sometimes, like I'll be fishing Risley Channel on the outgoing tides with, with a west wind, and it's beautiful because the tide's pushing me down, the wind's pushing me across. I can start up here, and I end up getting pushed right down here. It's just perfect. But if that wind is opposite and it's pushing me too fast, it, where I want it, where I want the opposite direction of pull, um, I really can't change the wind. But I can instead of fishing behind Margate, where the water is coming in Great Egg and it's flowing north, I can run to the other side of the inlet and fish behind Ocean City, where the current's pulling you south. So right. all of a sudden now I've got favorable conditions, and I didn't even have to use my trolling motor. Right. Yeah, you know, and that's ahead, the, the old school. That's the old school thing. You you have your your spots for conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, if the wind's blowing one one direction, okay, this this area is good to fish. If it's blowing another direction, I'll move and or, or I'll figure out a different drop in spot. So that way, we're we always have you know the right the right conditions, and that's that's key. And then the trolling motors kind of did away with that. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know if they did away with it. I, I think people just get lazy, you know, and, and I think honestly, to be fair to a lot of people, maybe it's not that they're lazy. It's that they just don't understand, you know, just because a fish was there on the incoming tide and this moon and this wind on one day does not mean it's going to be there. Um, the well, I shouldn't put it that way. Just because it was there on Thursday doesn't mean it's there on Friday. Just you because it was there at no today doesn't mean it's going to be there at 11 a.m. today. You have to understand why a flounder, um, let's use flounder because that's kind of my thing. It's easier for me to talk about. Um, you need to understand why a flounder wants to be in a certain situation at any given time. And then you have to find the location and the structure that's going to replicate that for them, right? So you can have this, you know, the, one of the legendary places down in South Jersey uh, behind Avalon is Patty's Hole. Mm -hmm. And Patty's Hole always produces inshore doormats every year. But it doesn't do it every day. It doesn't do it every week. It doesn't even do it every month. It'll maybe do it two days or three days out of the summer and somebody will pull out an eight pounder and everyone will go crazy and blitz the place. Well, that, that, that eight pounder that was in there was... 600 yards away the entire time on all the other conditions you just didn't read the conditions you just fished the hole the, the spots don't move the fish do the fish have fins they don't stay in one spot all the time through all the conditions and i think that's a big part of it people just don't understand what draws a fish to a certain spot fish got tails and no homes yeah yep. i'll um i i do have my conditions that that i look to fish certain spots but i think Today, in this world of instant gratification, people haven't yet developed the skills of boat handling and the knowledge of fish movements. They don't really understand or care. They just think they want to go to Patty's Hole and drop it in. But what I'll do is when that tide's running, I'll fish, I'll fish this spot all the whole time. And I may be starting my I may be start, starting my drift at one spot, and the next time I'm starting my drift a hundred feet that further down than the next street I'm finding my, my starting my drift a hundred feet further down. So I'm coming across different pieces at a channel so I can find a body of fish. But one thing's for sure. And this is something that might, you know, freak you out a little bit. A slack tide is one of my very best times for the biggest doormats. I will, I, agree. I will find that I will make sure when that tide starts to peter out, I will be at a certain hole at a certain spot and I'll let the wind push me across that hole. And that's usually when the whole time when I'm drifting for fluke inshore, I'm going to drift two rods and I'm going to drift one rod. Usually I'll, I'll fish like um, a century weapon junior seven footer with a light conventional reel. And I'll use a jig head like this, like a three quarter ounce jig head, nothing, nothing fancy. Right. And I'll, and about, 14, 16 inches up from it, I'll tie a dropper loop and I'll put a six odd bait holder hook on and I'll use it as a teaser rig. And what I'll do is in the backwaters, I'm usually always using these four inch gulp shrimp in the new penny color. Yeah. Four inch. 
They don't look like much. They look kind of like they kind of look like a finger, to be honest with you. They don't look like much, but I'll put that thing on a teaser. And then on the jig head itself, I'll put one of these five five inch gulps. I'll use them in glow white. But the five inch gulp is is a very particular size. We use the six inch offshore. They're great. The four inches are a little too small. They're totally overtaken by a jig head. But the five inch I'll use on this three quarter ounce and I'll jig that straight up and down right off the back of the boat. Usually when I position my boat for the drift, the first thing I'll do is I'll have a light spinning rod and I'll have the same rig on it, but I'll have this jig head. I'll go with a really light um, either three eighth or half ounce jig head, sometimes a quarter. And I'll throw that one out away from the boat about 30, 40 feet. I'll drop it in the rod holder and lock it up because it's immediately starting to settle towards the bottom. Okay. But the boat's drifting already. So that the idea with a quarter and three eighth ounce jig head is it's letting it swim near and near and touching the bottom, but it's not dragging across the bottom. Right. To me personally, I mean, I've been around this for a little while. I see videos. Everybody's got cameras tied on their fluke rigs now. Nothing worse than seeing, you know, a guy's fishing the backwater in, in 20 feet of water. He's got an ounce and a half jig. That bucktail is dredging across the muddy bottom. The teaser's up ahead of it. But, like, th that's it, bro. You can't do no better than that. You know, <laughs> let's make yep. a presentation so it kind of swims near the bottom. Because when it's dragging across the bottom, it's immediately hung up on seaweed. And there, and there goes your presentation. Uh, I agree. One of the one of the biggest things that I do is I will drop uh, when I'm vertical jigging for fluke. I'll mm -hmm. drop and let it hit the bottom, and then I don't I don't bounce it off the bottom. I bring it up, so I'll either raise my hand or I'll do a quarter crank on the reel to get about six inches mm -hmm. off the bottom. And and when I'm jigging, I'm I'm trying to keep it from hitting the bottom. I'm trying to get it as close to the bottom as possible without hitting it. And then every once in a while, I'll drop just to check, just to make sure I'm still near the bottom. Mm -hmm. I'll lift it back up and then I'll jig up here again. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm keeping it above the bottom. I'm not hitting the bottom. I'm not kicking up sand on the bottom. Yeah. And it's much more effective. And I have to tell you, that new penny shrimp is exactly what I use. I never start a fishing trip for fluke without having a new penny shrimp on the teaser at least. Um, I don't usually put it on the bottom, but on the teaser, almost always it's a new penny shrimp up top. And I've caught, I caught, um, some of my biggest flounder on that, on the teaser. Sure. And I think the thing is with that new penny shrimp in reality, it doesn't really look like a shrimp no. per se, it, but it does look like a mantis shrimp. It looks just like a mantis shrimp, which is, you know, the fluke love them. So that, that's just a killer in the backwaters. And I, I fished it on the jig a lot too, and they do great on the jig too, Rich. What if you take that same thing outside? Now, if we go out and we're fishing the reef sites, all of a sudden I'm using ounce and a half, two, three, four, five, six ounce ball jigs, and instead of that little that little six odd hook, I'm using one of these. This is an owner nine odd ballyhoo yeah. hook. It's a real long shank hook. It's it's a straight shank, no bent eyes, no bent eye, and no twisted point. And it just goes perfect on the uh, the six inch gulps, which usually we're using. Um, I'm usually using pink shine or glow, or I'm using the six inch mullets offshore. And again, during the course of the day, I'm changing between one and a half, two, three, four, five, six, depending on the conditions and what I can get away with. Well, yeah. Well, see, I'm not offshore as much. I, I think I'd switch up a lot more if I were offshore. Mm -hmm. Again, I tend to keep. Uh, I tend to keep the same thing on <laughs> for most of the day, unless the conditions change. Cause I do want to keep the lightest, the lightest uh, jig that I can in order to keep it near that, near that bottom to be able to hold it down there. Um, but the big thing is you got to match the size of that hook to that bait. So if you have to go to that nine aught, you can't put a four inch on there. It's going to look ridiculous. It's going to hang off by like a quarter of an inch and there's going to be no action. Hook really does a great job of keeping the smaller fish off too. You don't yeah. hook you don't hook the fish that are like below 15 inches. You just don't. Yeah. And, and, uh, Ed, we're using, um, on those bucktails, we're using what five aught to eight aught seven aught seven aught. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I have in these, these jig heads here. I think this has like a six aught 
and it's it's just about right. You know, it's good enough to to keep the smaller fluke off, but it's a good strong hook. But that weight, um, I find sometimes I even I have a light rod that's rigged with twenty and one that's rigged with fifteen, depending on the day. If the drift is if it's a little too much on the bottom with a quarter ounce jig head on the 15 pound line, I'll go to the other spinning rod that has the 20 just to get a little more drag, just to keep it up off the bottom a little bit more. I don't want it swimming at mid depth, but I want it, you know, near the bottom. Right. If you, look, you know, look at a video that's, you know, a million people put out and you got that bucktail dragging across the mud. It's like, you can't do no better than that. It's like, you know, come on, man. Yeah. You know, for, for, for me with the bucktails, I'm using the bigger hooks to, so you can use a bigger bait on a smaller jig head. Like I think the smallest we do is what three quarter rich. Yeah, but yep. you want to add, with a longer hook shank, you can use a little bit bigger bait, and the it's still gonna stick out past the hair on the bucktail, mm -hmm. and you're, you're still gonna have a decent hook gap. The yeah, gap I, is, I use a six inch the, inshore. I, I'll definitely yeah. use a six inch baits inshore. Um, it is kind of amazing that you, you can still catch some really small fish on a six inch bait. Um, flounder don't care. I mean, they get mad and they'll go after anything, but I, I can't, you know, I keep going back Frank to what you said, those videos with the, the thing just kind of dredging the bottom. It's, it's definitely not what you want to do. You don't want to be doing that. Now I, I have done some underwater video and I allow it to dredge the bottom just because the weight of the camera, you can't tell when you're touching the bottom. Mm -hmm. and you can't tell if it's the camera hitting the bottom or if it's the, the weight. Uh, but I don't fish when I'm doing that. So I actually have videos where I've actually hooked up a flounder, but I haven't set the hook because I, I'm not fishing it. I'm not act I've just stuck it in a rod holder and I'm, I'm trying to just keep it down near the bottom. But I, I watch a lot of people when they're out fishing and we're kind of drifting by and I I'm constantly looking at other people and seeing what they're doing because I'm nosy and man, they are just slamming the bottom. They're just popping the bottom all the time. And then in my mind, I'm thinking you're just attracting all of the fish that you don't want when you're kicking up all that fuss down there because the flounder isn't going to go traveling 30 yards to find it, but the dogfish will. It's going to see it off in the distance when it's doing its little patrol and it's going to come over and you're going to end up catching a dogfish. Maybe that's, I don't know if it's true or not, but maybe that's why I don't catch a lot of dogfish. I very rarely catch bycatch when I'm flounder fishing. Dogfish are more of a fall a fall time of the year. You know, the, they usually follow the striped bass down. But at that time, when you're if you're fishing a jig for blackfish, that's a time of year when when you really don't want to use a glow jig. You don't want to use a glow bead on your rig. You don't because the glow is going to attract the dogfish, or any motion is going to attract the, you know the spiny dogfish that you that bother us so much when we're out there. And sure, I don't really care if I get a little shark or a sea robin or something. It kind of amazes me that sharks and sea robins eat gulp now, but yeah, okay. <laughs> they do. Yeah. yeah and in shore, I, I will hit the bottom for tog and I will move that jig a lot when I'm offshore. I'm just, and tell me, maybe I'm wrong when I'm offshore, I I'm constantly moving my arm, but it's only to try to keep the jig on the bottom. Perfect. I'm trying to not move it. Yeah. But next to a jetty, I'm bouncing that thing, trying to, kick mm -hmm. up something guys um, guys that are really good at catching small fish they i mean i know a guy he isn't a guy gets his limit every day on a certain head boat the guy's aces he's a true gentleman very nice man not really good at big fish but here i am like i said last week i was out on allison's nightmare everybody else is catching a lot of fish i was fishing the whole whole white crab all day and i had my shot i had my one good fish on popped them off you know, it's part of the game. I would rather, when I get the chance to be out there in big fish land, that's the way I'm going to fish. Sounds like John. John, you're you're all about the big fish only. I'm not swinging on everything. I'm waiting for that right bite. Yeah. And let them little fish come and peck and let that big one just come in and bully them out. Yeah, I swing. I swing all the time. <laughs> it's not worth it. I want that big fish, and if I can release it, I can release it. I'll be happier than hell. Yeah. Ed, you're swinging all the time. Swings quantity. Free. Yeah. I like to catch yeah, a quantity guy. Quantity, but funny. You know what? it's funny. Quantity, but he throws a lot of his catch back and doesn't take most of it home. Well, that's I, just, I go I fishing to catch fish. I don't yeah. I'm yeah. not going to go out on the boat all day. And I mean, if 
and catch have a shot at one fish. That's no fun. That's one thing when you guys are talking <laughs> in the back waters. I mean, you can literally release everything. The fish, you know, they only catch them in 20, 30 foot of water. They don't they don't get damaged at all. Uh -uh. Uh, the fish bringing the fish up from a hundred, sometimes that fish fights so hard. I mean, it, it'll actually blow its gills out. You come up, it's blowing, blowing from the gills. Or sometimes, you know, sometimes the swim bladder is extending out of the butthole a little bit. But sometimes it's actually their intestines. When it's their yeah. intestines, that's a little hard to get that to go back, man. I mean, you know, you can you can put it in a total water and try to let it acclimate to some pressure and see if it works. But chances of that thing surviving, I don't know. But that's part of the game. You just got to do the best you can do. I know what's something I started doing this year. On my charters, something that I personally do, I'm only keeping two fish a day. I'm only keeping I'm only keeping male fish, and I'm letting everything over like six, seven pounds go. I love that. Uh, now you know what? If I got five other guys on my boat on my charter, they can do whatever they want. If it's their legal fish, they have the right to do whatever they want to do with that fish. And I will never, ever, if I see somebody put a picture up of a beautiful fish they caught, and somebody asks, "Did you release it?" You know what? It's an irrelevant question because it's not their fish. Right. It's I, none, you know, of, none of their business. They're we, just we have a lot of conversations about that. And I, I don't think any of us, you know, Ed and John or I, we won't say anything. Um, I, I totally support if it's legal, go ahead, catch it. I'm not going to complain, but I'm not going to say that it doesn't bother me when you see the same person going out. And it's their fourth post on social media in a week. And it's limit, 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 limit. Every single time. It's like, all right, man. How much how, fish how, can how you eat? You gonna, yeah, how much are you going to eat? Because um, you're killing. The, I don't know. It's but, legal, so I'm not going to complain. I, but I, it just gives me a bad feeling. You know what, though? It's kind of, you know, me worrying about somebody else's fish is kind of like, it's kind of like my neighbor just bought like this new Tesla. It's like a ninety thousand dollar car. I'm not worried about if he can pay the bill or not. That's irrelevant. It's not. It's not my car. Yeah. It's I can't. What you can't worry about someone else's fish. You can just lead by a good example. Do the best you can do, because I and I don't even care if it's me or not. But if somebody jumps in a thread and says, "Did you release that fish?" That that just rubs me the wrong way, man. Because it's just somebody who's trying to start a problem, and this person. Here's the kicker. The person might not even be a togger. Right. They, you know, might be, they might catch, you know, catch something somewhere. They might not be a togger. They have no idea that a large percentage of those fish can't go back. So just shut the hell up. Why are you starting shit? Yeah, I see a lot that can't go back. I mean, you look at it and like I've seen them. Did you release it? It's like, I hope not, because that thing is that thing is floating somewhere. You may as not, well just keep it. Not your fish, bro. It's not your yeah. That is an irrelevant question. That's just starting trouble. It's very funny that you mentioned this because I, I'd say it was like my second year going offshore for togging, um, fishing 120 feet of water. It was a slow day. I think I had like a four pounder and then I caught a 15 inch fish. It was tagged. Eyes were blown out, intestines are popping out. What are you going to do? I understand it's a tagged fish. But I throw it back, it's going to die. So, yeah, I took it. And, man, you should have seen the, the hatred and ridicule I was catching on the Internet for that. And But, again, it goes back to it was a legal fish. Shut your mouth. That's it. Not, it's, not your, it's not your fish. So it's like there's two things. Either you're jealous or you're just stupid. Yeah. yeah. Neither, neither one of which I think are very becoming. And I don't think it's nice to be either one. So I just, you know, if it's not your fish, keep your comments to yourself. And, yeah. and I understand it. It was a tagged fish. I would have loved to let a tagged fish go, but it, come on. It's going to make more tags. Yeah. yeah, I know that that bothers you, John, because you, you talk about that that fish every once in a while. I don't think you should feel bad at all for it. Um, it I mean, you caught it. Uh, you know, you take the tag and you return it and say it's dead. Yeah. That's all there is to it. There's nothing to it. Now, Let's just keep the controversial stuff going here. So here's what Rex is saying. Yes. <laughs> Catching, releasing, and holding the fish by the gills bothers. Oh, my him. God. It drives me nuts. So I want to say one thing. You can grab you can grab fish by the gill plates and not damage the gills. It is possible if you know what you're doing. 
but I do see guys with their literally with their hand all the way up in there. You can tell they're right in the middle of the gill, you know, mm-hmm. um, that, that bothers me. But again, I don't say anything. You know, people say, "Oh, did you bred it." I see you breaded it before you before you released it. Okay, yeah. I got it. I, I don't think they tried to drag it across the sand, but they caught the fish. Um, I don't know, man. It's some things bother me. I don't like seeing seven days in a row limits. Um, I, but I, but I, I don't like seeing it. But I, they have the right to do it, and I'm not going to argue with them. It's just okay. I think I just think they have, it's a shame. Do it now. What's that? Yep. Can only do what we're doing now. Like I said, I just yeah. told you what my self-imposed limits are. Um, it just so happened the rest of the guys on my charter, like four or five of them are all are all going by those same self-imposed limits. Not that they have to, because I really don't care if they do or not. But you can look at my posts over the last three years, and I can't tell you how many limits of blackfish you're going to see in there. How many? You know, it's just how many limits of fluke. You're going to see decks full of fluke. Yeah. Yo, God bless, man. You know. Yeah. I'm sure not out killing more than I more than I keep or more than I want to. And I'm certainly not keeping over the legal limit. And that's the point. But just because we did that then doesn't mean we're going to do that now. But right. the point is, if it's not your fish, unless your purpose is to start a flame war, maybe, you know, if you feel so strong about wanting to release fish, then maybe you should release 100% of your fish. But if you go on a boat and you give somebody shit, about not releasing a fish, you'll probably never get invited on a charter again. You might even get popped in the head, so you never know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a way to make friends. Well, a lot of people like to argue on social media. It's like the, it makes their day. It's all they have going. But in person, they would never do that. And I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> I was just going to say the exact same thing. No, no. They would never do that. I know quite a few people. Actually, I've been threatened by people that make jigs. They, they would say two words to me if they saw me in the street. Come on, man. It's I love those. Yeah. The stories, man. The stories, Frank. Frank, we got to get out on the water sometimes so you can hear some of the stories from these two. Love to. Why don't you uh, jump in when we're fluking in a couple of weeks? We got room for a few. Yeah. Yeah, yeah let me know. I, I I'd like to get out there. It, it would be hilarious. Some of the stories. I just like sitting back and listening to other people's stories. That makes the day for fishing for me. Uh, I'm I'm good with that. All right, so we're coming up on an hour and a half. Is there anything for spring fishing, Frank, that you just want to share with anyone on any of the species, any other species we didn't talk about that you think people should keep in mind? No, you got sea bass popping in and out of here, though. Um, The fluke is going to happen really good inshore for us, South Jersey, before it starts happening up in North Jersey. So I think that that regulation might be a little bit cockeyed, you know, down in South Jersey have fluke in the back they don't really have them up in the rivers or up in the rare and just yet um you know so i think this the season thing and the per the way the regulations came out is a little bit funky but i am really happy about the sea bass opening to take the pressure off of the blackfish in that in that awkward month of october it's going to be a much more even year it's not there aren't going to be those dead spots you know between seasons anymore There, there was nothing worse than that time between flounder and and when the striped bass came in Mm-hmm. I mean, this this right now kind of stinks. You know what? It was kind of funny. <laughs> it, it, uh, me and you had that conversation, uh, Frank. I'm not a big striped bass fisherman. I, I, it's not my favorite. I'll do it to kill the time. And that's really it. And now we got this closed gap. I'm like, yeah, all right, cool, man. We can make some things happen. Uh, cool. I'll I'll tell you this, Frank. Last year in, uh, in April, actually it was this week last year, I was catching uh, 20 inch plus flounder off of Staten Island in the Raritan Bay. Really? Yep. Yep. And then, <laughs> and then, and then a, a, a striper blitz came through and I switched over. <laughs> but I was catching them. And I'll um, say, so John, they, they are there. After our last striper trip, John won't be fishing striper with us anymore. <laughs> no. You know, when, when stripers, when stripers come in and miss, though, they will really mess some stuff up, man. They'll put the flounder off the bite for sure. They'll put blackfish off the bite heavy. Yeah. I mean, you'll be on a wreck literally bailing blackfish, and you can see a school of stripers rolling towards you on the surface. You look on the machine, you start to see them show up, and you can literally see all the blackfish on the machine just boop, 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 boop. And, and all of a sudden you don't see them anymore, and they all hunker down. And then when the bass leave, you give it 15, 20 minutes and they start popping out and they start feeding again. So stripers 
are are a real um they're a real hell of a predator species you got going there man they got those big mouths and 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 they eat a lot they eat rip like through anything i i've seen them shut down tog like nothing mm -hmm. i mean right at a bridge and all of a sudden you catch one striped bass and you just just pick up and move because if there's one there's ten mm -hmm. um and you just got to move either three pilings down and hope or just go to a different bridge because it'll it'll shut it down for a half an hour to an hour until the striped yeah. bass decide to move dogfish does the exact same thing yeah you know they get in there they they get in there and start eating and there's just a ravenous pack of them and you know i mean how many times do you roll up a 40 pound striper and you have you have six dogfish nipping at its fins it's yeah. a thing why don't they leave that big fish alone but there's just so many of them yeah oh yeah they're uh, i'm not a fan of dog fishing <laughs> No. They're fun to catch when I was little on a kayak because they pull you around to get a three and a half foot, you know, they, they, like right now, if you just want to catch a fish right now in the backwaters, the big dogfish are coming in over the next two weeks. So be careful when you're out there and just know that if you're going to be bottom fishing, you have a shot at big dogfish, not just the little guys, because they're all in the back and they're spawning. And yeah, I mean, you're talking like four footers um, back I just there. My work arounds you know yeah <laughs> yeah you gotta you gotta pick through them so yeah all right well frank thanks for coming on i really appreciate it i could talk for four hours but i'm not going to do that to you um <laughs> everyone's got work tomorrow yeah um so thanks for coming on really appreciate it uh everybody i who do we have on next week i should know this yeah, you're the coordinator i closed all my screens i don't remember is next week I thought next I week is just us. I think it's just us. We're going to talk about the opening of, of flounder season. Um, and then after that, we have a couple of other ones coming up. Um, Philly girl fishing is going to be on in, uh, in May talking about some party boat fishing. She does a lot of that. If people haven't seen her, um, I just love watching her videos because she looks like she just has a ball no matter where she is and no matter what she's doing or who she's with. And, uh, and, and I just love watching watching her out there on those party boats. So she's going to be on sometime in May, hopefully closer to the holiday. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be down in the Outer Banks fishing in May, May or early June. So that's going to be fun. I'll, I'll get a little earlier season redfish and trout action down there. So I'm looking forward to that. But I can't wait for Flounder to kick off coming up here. And hopefully on Sunday, I'll get out there for some tog. So. All right. Everyone, thanks for tuning in. We'll get out the uh, the link for the next week, and then we'll announce the, the guests coming up after that. We've got some good ones coming up soon. So uh, we're just going to keep going, rolling into the season. Hopefully hopefully, we'll all get out on the water and we'll get to, fish, get to show some good fish soon uh, in between these windstorms that keep rolling through. Uh, but the drum are being caught now. I've seen some coming out of the Great Bay right now, some decent-sized ones. Um, the tog some really nice ones out there on the on the boats when they can get offshore so guys get out there get on them and we'll catch you next week <laughs>